Hello, everyone. We will now begin the session on peace and uh, prosperity on the Korean Peninsula uh, Conference on North Korean Education Reform Trends in the Kim Jong-un Era. Before we begin with the presentations and uh, the discussions, we will be hearing from Sang Jin Tan from Korea Educational Development Institute. Hello, everyone. I am Sang Jin An of KEDI. Due to COVID-19, we are in very difficult times, yet yesterday, today, and tomorrow for three days, the Ministry of Unification is hosting the Korea Global Forum for Peace 2020. And I would like to congratulate the hosting of KGFP. And I would like to wholeheartedly thank the Minister of Unification and members of the Ministry of Unification. As was explained by the moderator, today we will have an in-depth discussion on North Korean education reform trends in the Jong-un Kim Kim Jong-un era, and uh, I would like to thank our moderator, uh, Dr. Park, and uh, the two speakers, uh, Dr. Cho and uh, also Dr. Ji Su Kim, on the trends of elementary secondary education reform in North Korea in Kim Jong-un era. And uh, we have three discussants, Professor Kang from uh, Chungnam University, and uh, we also have to Dr. Kim Ji Hae and Dr. Kang Ho Jae. We are living in a transition per period, um, a hyper connected society, the fourth industrial revolution. So we are living in dramatic change and uh, we had a lot of concerns for the future and uh, it was difficult uh, to forecast uh, the future due to uncertainties and uh, added to this uh, there was the COVID-19, which led to acceleration of change. We are going beyond untaxed society. We are uh, going on to a digital society. And uh, we have now come to this situation against this backdrop. The Korean Peninsula has another challenge, which is going beyond unification leading to lasting peace and prosperity on the uh, Korean Peninsula. So this is a uh, challenge and a mission for those living in this era. Despite this difficult situation, we are having this forum, and uh, we would like to review the educational reform in North Korea. Also, we would like to seek ways in which education can contribute to peace and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula to utilize education to enhance peace. I think that this will be a golden opportunity for us to uh, pool our wisdom together. And I would like to thank the online participants and uh, I hope for your health and safety. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director, for your opening remarks. Before we go on to the presentation and discussions, I would like to briefly introduce our session. There will be two presenters and uh, three discussants. I would like to introduce uh, the five participants. Uh, first, we have with us Senior Research Fellow of Korea Research Fellow of Korea Education Development Institute, Jisoo Kim, and uh, Senior Research Fellow of Korea Institute for National Unification, Jung Ah Jo. And we have three discussants. Uh, first, uh, Ji Hae Kim, Associate Research Fellow of KEDI, and from Jeonnam University, Professor Kang. And uh, lastly, uh, Korean Studies at Free University of Berlin, from Germany, Ho Jae Kang. So North Koreans' education change uh, reflects the reform that is needed in society and the economy also. Uh, education reform gives us insight into the direction of future reform. Therefore, I think this is an important and significant theme. And at this time, we want to study and understand in depth the education reform in the Kim Jong-un era. First, we will be hearing from uh, Ji Su Kim, Dr. Ji Su Kim, on North Korean education reform trends in Kim Jong-un era. Uh, 
we ask you to keep it to 20 minutes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I want to ask you a question. What is the North Korean society that you have in mind? Do you think it is a stationary country or is it evolving and changing? In the media, it seems as if North Korean society is stationary. And since the uh, Korean War, we don't know how North Korea has changed. We think of North Korea as a socialist country, a country of arduous march, and that some market uh, economy uh, factors have been combined into the society of North Korea. But actually, according to my study, I see that North Korea is changing and the education sector is changing in North Korea. And this is something that we can see. And uh, today I want to study with you trends of elementary and secondary education in North Korea. North Korean society, I think, went through four phases for economic systems. From 45 to 1958, there was coexistence of planned economy and market economy. It was not a socialist economy at the time. And it, after 1958, with the uh, territory and land reform, it, in 1959 to 1994, it was a truly planned economy. And uh, there was a market, but it was a supplementary market of a agricultural sector limit only. Then, after 1994, during the RDS March, after they went through the RDS March, there was weakening of a planned economy and the market expanded. During the Kim Jong-un regime from 2012, it seems that the market economy is recognized in part by law. So companies can have freedom in operation and also farms are operated by families. Therefore, families can get differentiated income based on their yield. Also, companies can pay different wages to workers based on their merits. So workers are now receiving different wage, and uh, this leads to important changes in education. Uh, this has become a driving force of change in the education system. Depending on what capabilities and technologies you uh, receive, then you can get a different wage. And uh, this has led to changes in education system. Uh, since uh, uh, the liberation of uh, South Korea, we have not changed our uh, compulsory education system, especially since in the Kim Jong-un era, there has been major changes. In the past, uh, there were uh, four, six year uh, system and now it has been changed to five year for elementary and uh, the middle school uh, secondary education has been divided to, to three years and three years so now it's five year for elementary school and uh, three years and three years for uh, lower secondary and upper secondary this has changed uh, to a complete revision of uh, their uh, curriculum and education system. Also, for the upper secondary education, they have a technology uh, school, and this is a sign of major changes. So let's look at it in detail. In the Kim Jong-un regime, the purpose of education has changed. As a national goal, they wanted to construct a strong socialist country, and it was similar in the Kim Jong-il regime regime too. But looking at the slogan, they say that uh, let's leap with science and secure future with education. That has become their slogan, and they changed their education. There was a reform to their education law, and it has led to a education goal change. Uh, making whole society intelligent was the previous regime's uh, goal. Now it is making all people well-versed in science and technology. This is a grand slogan. So all people have to become science and technology human resources. So there's a question of whether this is possible. Isn't this too ambitious of a goal? Uh, that is a question that comes to mind. And North Korea 
They changed their education law and have changed their education goal. This shows their will. And when there was a change to the law, I had some doubts and questions. And the educational reforms that followed seem to be driven to uh, uphold and implement this goal. And as they are implementing this, they also talk about reform education to match global education trend and educational demand. They want to change their education so that it can meet global standards, and it comes out frequently in the media. Uh, they st strengthened and underlined the need for meeting global education trends. And uh, how is this being uh, implemented in schools? We see improvement in quality of education. They have reformed the school system, and there has been a full-scale revision of curriculum. One clear characteristics in the curriculum change is they uh, strengthened experiments. So in the past, when they emphasized juche and a leader uh, worship, uh, this experiment might be a bit dangerous. And it was not something that they tried out, such research activities and experiments. Uh, they have not strength, uh, emphasized this in the past. And this is a major change that they are emphasizing this. Also, for improvement of quality of education, they enacted the Teachers Act. Also, they established Educational Doctrine Execution Act. So this is uh, similar to curriculum. So the curriculum now has become connected to law and when there was a education reform it cannot be implemented if it is not supported by laws and institutions that is why they created the educational doctrine execution act also they have strengthened uh, the distant education and uh, there are millions of uh, adults who are participating in distant uh, tertiary education so for to support this they have created a distant education act and they also also established a Vocational Technology Education Act. As a new law this year, the most recent uh, act is the Distant Education Act. So this shows the various changes taking place in education sector in North Korea. Going on to elementary school system, uh, as I said, the school system was changed from 426 to 533. 426 seems to lag behind global norms. And so their elementary education has increased from four years to five years. This shows that they are following global trends and it, they have uh, three, uh, and rather for the kindergarten, it has mandatory education. So now it's 12 years of compulsory education because it includes compulsory kindergarten education. And in kindergarten, if they are teaching reading and writing, it is actually a 633 system, which is almost the same as South Korea's school system. With the revision of the school system from the four-year to five-year, they have changed the uh, lower secondary and upper secondary curriculums have fully been changed, and they have new publication of textbooks. Uh, you will see this later on that in 2013 and 2013. Uh, post-2013, the curriculum and textbooks have improved greatly. With the new education system, the, the uh, facilities have been improved too. They have uh, uh, adopted decided to adopt the multifunctional classes nationwide. Multifunctional classes is a multimedia classroom in Korea. It means they will use the national intranet and uh, multimedia uh, teaching material and experiment and uh, research can be possible in these multifunctional classes. They say they are going to have these classes nationwide. It doesn't seem that they have realized this yet, but they are in the process of creating these multifunctional classes nationwide, and they are going to have multimedia education, virtual education, and sharing of educational resources via a database. These are some uh, goals that uh, they have for enhancing facility. Also, they are stressing research-based learning, uh, such as uh, stressing STEM, uh, science, technology, and engineering, and math. Uh, they have integrated education system uh, with uh, STEM. And in major schools of North Korea, uh, they are implementing this. Uh, and uh, this was covered in North Korean media several times. 
and they have a integrated education discussions, and they also have information technology curriculum. Uh, in the past, it was called computer, but now they have changed this subject name to information and technology subject. They have increased uh, the. Uh, hours of teaching English too. So it's just two years, uh, but uh, as you can see, the textbooks have changed greatly. It's uh, colorful and the content, uh, the previous uh, textbook was on topics on the right hand side, the new textbook, it's based on activities. Also, during the teacher's training, uh, they talk about critical thinking. They're using critical thinking in an English uh, textbook. I was surprised to see this word critical thinking uh, being taught in a teacher's training program. And this is a major change in North Korean education. Also, ideology-wise, there have been changes. Um, in North Korea, they wanted to educate philosophy and in the past uh, they strengthened stressed uh, the leader and how wonderful the leader is but in Kim Jong-un era in the 2019 conference they said that the greatness is magnified but uh, it will conceal the truth by c making the leader mysterious. So only when the leader is perceived humanly and as a colleague, absolute faithfulness will come. So this is a different type of uh, education. In the past, they want to mystify the leader, but now he wants to be perceived as a human. In addition to that, he recognizes his uh, lacking that in the last year, I regretted that uh, for the past year and that I should work harder in the next year. So it was the first time that I saw in 2017 the New Year message that he talks about his shortcomings, that he was, uh, he thought that it was unfortunate and uh, of what had happened in the previous year. On the, the education conditions and educational environment enhancements, uh, they have uh, exemplary like schools that have been established and uh, they are making multifunctional facility classes. Multimedia can be used in these classrooms. They have computers, network, and large screens, and they have IP cameras. Also, they will have uh, scanners. And uh, of course, in North Korea, they have great gaps in the cities and in the rural areas. Uh, they don't have internet, but uh, instead of the internet, they are using national intranet. Also, they have a large-scale database uh, to use uh, for technology and science materials. And this is a picture of the Changdok School. A major, the biggest picture is the virtual reality, and they also have the uh, area where they can to, uh, learn. English language. Of course, this is one of the top-notch schools, and uh, this is the uh, Science and Technology Center. They have a great database here uh, to use, so the teachers and uh, the students cannot use the internet, so they will use the national internet to have access to this database. And this is a school in North Korea. Of course, this is also a top-notch. It is elementary school, and they are using notebooks, laptops. Uh, so uh, if uh, they cannot uh, have computers at uh, the schools, they bring their own laptops uh, that they use at home. So you will see that the laptops are different by student. And uh, I saw this in a publication in North Korea. It's probably one of the best schools. And uh, they also changed the teacher policies. But teacher policies had been enhanced. It was traditional to um, strengthen ideology of teachers. But in Kim Jong-un era, priority is given to expertise of teachers. In the past, uh, they stressed the spirit of the teachers. But now the expertise of the teachers is being stressed. 
So they are giving priority to expertise, which is a change from past practices. And they are now stressing in-service teacher education. Uh, they use uh, remote education, and uh, they are doing uh, active remote education for in-service education. Uh, they are utilizing the uh, Kim Hyung-jik School Teachers University uh, to provide uh, re-education of teachers. And uh, they also have um, exemplary classes, experience classes, and uh, teacher review meetings. Also, uh, in they are encouraging outstanding students. Uh, they have these advanced um, middle schools. These middle school students, uh, they go to Kim Il-sung uh, Engineering School and uh, the government is encouraging these outstanding students to go to teacher education uh, universities, and they are revising curriculums for teacher education. Also, the teachers are leading the uh, education reform. So that's uh, uh, the essence of my presentation. And uh, this now is from UNICEF, uh, the statistics of North Koreans' uh, computer usage. Those in their teens, about 70% of them have experience using, the comp using computers. So uh, information level in North Korea seems to be quite advanced. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I could not give you enough time to give you the presentation. You uh, had to rush through your slides. And I would like to thank Ji Soo Kim for the presentation. Next. We're going to hear about North Korea's higher education reform in the era of knowledge economy. And the presenter is Dr. Chong Ah Joo from uh, Korea Institute for National Unification, Unification. Good afternoon. I am Chong Ah Joo uh, from senior, I'm a senior research fellow at the Korea Institute for National Unification. I am going to talk about the uh, North Korea's higher education reform. And I have included the word knowledge economy or the era of knowledge economy. Uh, it's not because I prefer these words, but in North Korea, uh, the government actually does uh, define the current era as the era of knowledge economy. And the North Korean government wants to nurture talents who are competitive in the era of knowledge economy so that North Korea can become a, a, a major socialist power in the world. So I'm going to talk about the major changes in educational policy uh, currently and also about the reform in the higher education sector and uh, also some reform of the university status and curriculum. And uh, the distant education was mentioned by the previous uh, speaker. Well, in the higher education sector, uh, there is efforts to promote distance uh, education in order to achieve uh, uh, the goal of having all of the Korean people become well-versed in science and technology. And I'm going to talk about the achievement of these reform efforts. Now, if I look at the changes in the educational policies of North Korea, uh, one key highlight is that uh, North Korean government defines the era as the knowledge economy era. And also, it redefines the role of education necessary for this era. So uh, the North Korean authorities uh, define current times as the era of information industries and the era of knowledge economy. And and so they have defined the goal of the so-called educational revolution in the new century uh, to make a country a socialist educational powerhouse in the 21st century by nurturing uh, young students and making all people well-versed in science and technology. Uh, now, the, there is a reform that has been undertaken in North Korea. And North Korean authorities are have been conducting this reform uh, to keep abreast of the global educational development trends. And there are many catchphrases that they utilize. For example, in the independent standpoint, that uh, is that we stand firmly on our own feet while looking out onto the world and to develop into education in our distinct Korean way um, by adopting global education development in experiences. Uh, these are some of the wordings that they use. And also, 
uh, it appears that they have also benchmarked, in some sense, uh, the higher education reform of China. Uh, and they also emphasize the need to enhance the quality of education to become world class. And also, the teachers' competency building uh, is uh, taken to be an important goal. Uh, and um, the North Korean authorities see that it is important to improve the qualifications and the capacity of the teachers themselves. And in order to nurture people who are competitive in this digital age, uh, there is a great effort towards incorporating digital technologies in the education delivery. And uh, some of the slogans include, let's make a leap forward with science and guarantee the future with education. So in order to keep abreast of the global trends, uh, you know, North Korea needs to be aware of the latest trends and advances in other countries, which is why uh, the North Korean authorities have emphasized the foreign language education. Uh, in 2016, uh, there was uh, this letter uh, which provides instructions to receive uh, many foreign students to universities in North Korea and also to send uh, its students abroad. Of course, it hasn't really taken place very much, but um, that has been part of the initiatives that were announced. Uh, and uh, there are three major instructions that have been uh, provided by the leadership in North Korea in regards to educational reform. In 2014 and 2019, there were instructions. Uh, there are some differences between the two instructions. So in 2019, uh, we see that the instructions have become more specific, and it's an elaboration of the general direction that was outlined in the instructions in 2014. For example, it seeks to promote, uh, you know, elementary, secondary, and higher education system reform, and it seeks to strengthen the capacity of teachers and establish long-term educational strategy. And so there are more specific instructions and also address the educational gap between the different uh, local regions. So there are many specific instructions that have been outlined in the instruction delivered in 2019. Uh, one of the key aspects of the reform is the university restructuring. So uh, in North Korea, there were four to six year universities and colleges, and also there are uh, th two to three year uh, professional schools. And there has been a major restructuring of these higher education sector. Uh, so in 2019, um, actually, there was uh, expansion of the four-year universities uh, by converging and integrating colleges. So more than 10 universities were established by integrating colleges uh, in similar sectors or regions. But some years after, uh, so to be specific, the end of 2019, there was a reversal of this policy. So the regional universities were once again disintegrated, and uh, they were returned to the status of individual colleges. So there are about three to four so-called universities remaining due to this policy change. and. So there is the four to six year universities, and then there are also colleges, and then there are uh, vocational technology colleges. So these are the three types of higher education institutions that are dominant in North Korean higher education sector now. And also, uh, they also categorize types of university into the academic type and the practical type. So to nurture professionals uh, with expertise that can actually work in the fields, you know, this these are 
nurtured by the practical type universities, whereas scholars are nurtured by the academic type uh, universities. Now, if we look at the departments, uh, they're undergoing a consolidation and adjustment of departments. Uh, there are uh, newly installed advanced technology and science departments, for example, robotics uh, and also in nanomaterial engineering. Um, and also, there is an effort to expand the graduate schools. In the past, you would graduate from the university, and then you would enter the graduate school, where there is a master's degree program and the PhD uh, program. But uh, in between, there was a significant gap between the university and then entrance into a graduate school. But now there is a closer linkage between the university and the graduate school so that the student can graduate from the university and go straight into the graduate school uh, without any discontinuation of research and education. And one of the key goals is to have every Korean, North Korean, be well-versed in science and technology. So in order to achieve this, there are distant education programs that are delivered by the uh, universities or colleges. Uh, and these programs can be accessed from different parts of Korea. So how many uh, universities or colleges are there in North Korea? It's very difficult to have accurate statistics because North Korea does not open official statistics. And so there are many consol much consolidation and integration and that took place. So the numbers are not clear. But we could look at the uh, university and colleges that were mentioned in the news media. And also, we could look back at uh, what changes have been documented in these media. And we estimate that about 260 uh, uh, universities um, are, are, exist in North Korea. But this excludes a special sector universities such as those uh, specializing in politics and military schools. So uh, in ed essentially, there are more than 260 universities uh, in North Korea. But of course, there may be universities that did not get coverage in the media that we may have missed. Uh, so it's probably a, a larger number of universities that exist in North Korea. And then uh, by type, the so-called universities include Kim Il-sung University and Kim Chek University of Technology, Goryeo Seonggyungwan, uh, and also there are colleges in each uh, disciplinary sector. Uh, and also there are factory colleges and the vocational technology universities, about 50 of them. Now, by major, industrial and uh, mineral engineering and studies uh, take up the lion's share of the major departments in universities. And uh, in social science and economics, uh, you know, uh, natural sciences, these tend to be uh, represented relatively uh, on a smaller scale in the, uh, you know, departments that exist in universities and colleges. Now, if we look at the curriculum reform, it's very difficult to make an analysis because we do not have access to the latest uh, curriculum um, you know, documents and information, but we know that general trend is towards specialization of curriculum by university types. So on the one hand, you have the academic type universities like Kim Il-sung University or Kim Chek University of Technology. Uh, on the other hand, you have the more practical type colleges, uh, such as the uh, colleges that are specializing in, you know, respective sectors and the factory colleges and vocational technology colleges. Uh, so there are different types of curriculums across these different types of universities and colleges. And uh, there have been integration and reorganization of departments and installation of more advanced science and technology departments. Uh, and also there is greater continuation from university to graduate school. And also uh, there is a, an effort to choose one exemplary university that has has great um, expertise in a particular area and to have them develop a, you know, curriculum and um, textbooks that can be disseminated to other universities and departments that have a similar focus. 
So, for example, a computer engineering uh, university in Pyongyang, they would be uh, they were chosen as the exemplary um, university, which would develop uh, educational materials, which can then be disseminated to other colleges and universities with a similar disciplinary focus. Now. In Korea, the students choose uh, their courses of choice, uh, but in North Korea, that's not the case. It's partly because there is a limitation of educational resources and limitation uh, in the number of professors. Uh, so similar to how uh, there is a set uh, curriculum for uh, secondary level schools here in Korea. Uh, similarly, in North Korea, uh, even at the u higher education sector, that was the case. But now the North Korean government is aware that that is really not in line with the global norms. So they have decided to introduce the credit system. Uh, and more recently, there's an emphasis on foreign language education. And also there has been some reform in the way exams are carried out. For example, computer-based multiple choice exams uh, are, are now being ad administered in North Korea as part of a uh, university admission procedure. Now, let me talk about the distance education. Recently, distance education uh, starting from 2010 has been emphasized great, greatly. And since Kim Jong-un took over, the vision to have all Koreans well-versed in science and technology um, is, has become very important. And one way to achieve that was to deliver distant uh, remote education. And so early in the new millennium, this started to take place. And in 2007, in the remote education center was established at the Kim Chek University of Technology. So they did a lot of uh, technological research that would uh, pro make it possible to deliver such um, distant education. And then in 2011, uh, there was a distant education department formed within Kim uh, Kim Chek University of Technology. So there are distant programs where people can get degrees. And so in 2015, uh, there were these uh, distant education colleges as part of the Kim Chek University. But in at the end of 2019, uh, with the move towards uh, you know, breaking down the universities into individual colleges. In accordance with that, they have converted the distant education universities to uh, distant education colleges. So now this is a screen capture of uh, the distant education platform. So you can see it's quite similar to some of the websites that we can see at universities. So you have the section where you input your ID and password, and the Kim Chek University of Technology students can log in using their ID and password to access course material and post questions and uh, utilize self-learning materials. And there's a, there's a system for the Kim Chek University of Technology. And then there is the Kim Il-sung University's uh, distant learning platform. So it's different. So you can see, once again, you have to key in your ID and password to access uh, the materials there. Uh, the previous screen captures were from the PC, a uh, personal computer. But you can also log in through tablet PCs. Uh, so the difference here is that the remote, the distance education uni universities, um, for example, in the previous uh, screen capture, you could directly access the system 
of the university that you belong to. Now here, you actually have a number of uh, distant education um, colleges, uh, and you have to click to which school you belong to to access the contents. Now, there is multimedia learning uh, that is an important initiative uh, at the higher education uh, sector. So I have talked about how the education reform has taken place in the higher education sector in North Korea. Um, and uh, the I, it's very difficult for me to assess the actual outcomes because I have not been on site to really see for myself. But there are some expected outcomes. Uh, I think, first of all, we can expect that this these efforts uh, led to an expansion of higher education. Uh, so not only through the more formal education uh, in the universities, but there are also increased number of students who access the distant learning modules uh, from these universities. And also there is an effort to uh, enhance the efficiency of higher education through integration and restructuring of schools. So. Uh, but uh, in North Korea, there has been an effort to move away from the university focus model to a college uh, uh, focus model more recently. So these integration and reorganization uh, is ultimately leading to a greater efficiency. Uh, and I think incorporation of more digital technologies uh, in education will enhance science and technology education. and. Uh, if these reforms uh, become uh, very successful, uh, we could also see uh, great outcomes. Uh, but because of the limitations or the characteristics of uh, DPRK's regime, there are certain challenges ahead. For example, the, the, um, the funds that DPRK has to support educational reform is rather limited. So there is insufficient fund uh, given the economic situation in DPRK. So the government uh, talks about and commands that there be education reform, but securing the budget necessary to carry the reform out uh, is actually left up to the individual universities and colleges. Uh, for example, computers. The, each of the universities often ask the students themselves or the parents to chip in to buy more computers. Uh, so that's the limitation, this limitation of government support financially uh, to carry out the reforms. And in the case of Kim Il-sung University and Kim Jong University of Technology, uh, these schools are very um, well placed in terms of the environment and the quality of education. But then the other colleges that are located in more provincial areas, they tend to experience a significant an educational quality gap versus these more prestigious universities. And also, uh, despite the fact that the North Korean government emphasizes international exchange in education, but you know there are limitations because of the nature of the regime, and also given the inter-Korean relations and the sanctions on North Korea, uh, you know these uh, factors all make it very difficult to continue uh, the international exchange and thereby improve the educational delivery. And the university education should be better linked to the industries in order for the education, university education to have an impact on improving the industries. But in North Korea, uh, you know, the people do not really have a choice as to their occupation. Uh, so, you know, they are assigned to certain posts. So it's very difficult to have the university education really create synergies with the industries because the individual's choice is limited. Thank you very much. 
as the presenter mentioned, that doing research in North Korea is very difficult because of the lack of access to statistics and data. And despite such limitations, uh, the presenter was able to outline the education reform that took place in uh, DPRK and also talked about the achievements and the uh, expected outcomes. Thank you very much. So now we're going to enter into the discussions. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, Dr. Jihye Kim to deliver her comments with regards to the first presentation. Hello, everyone. I am Ji Hye Kim from the Korean Educational Development Institute. I would like to provide my discussion uh, on the presentation of uh, Dr. Ji Su Kim. Interest on the changes of education in a society not only helps understand the present, but also enables us to study the direction of change in that society. Moreover, uh, the perspective that education, moreover, because elementary and secondary education uh, creates an, uh, the ideal citizen presented by the society, I think it's even more so. I think that the presentation by Dr. Chisu Kim analyzed the trend of North Korean elementary and secondary education uh, in detail and helped in understanding North Korean society uh, in its per present state, and also it helps in predicting the future of education and also its society. Therefore, it uh, gives us a lot to learn from. Uh, since uh, North Korean regime, various changes have taken place in North Korean education, which is clearly different from previous uh, Kim Jong-il regime. The changes in each area of society started with uh, uh, the new leader and uh, different governing strategy provide justification of the regime and to prepare a basis of power. The presentation comprehensively uh, analyzed education of the Kim Jong-un era, and it also tries to understand the flow of economic and industrial and agricultural changes that led up to the changes in education. Um, and it also looked at the school system, education goal, curriculum changes, and what types of changes have happened in educational facility and teaching methods and uh, teacher educational policy. Uh, but it, we did not have time to cover all of the areas. So I would like to ask a couple of questions uh, to understand the situation a little bit more. First, I want to ask uh, what the difference of the slogan presented by Kim Jong-un regime, which is making all people well-versed in so so rather making all people well-versed in science and technology. How is this different from the making whole society intelligent uh, that was emphasized in the Kim Il-sung regime and the Kim uh, Jong-il regime? Uh, so, well, making all people well-versed in science and technology is emphasized in the Kim Jong-un era uh, is becoming the basis for many educational reforms, uh, such as focusing on science and technology sector. I think the changes of educational goals of the two different eras may uh, be under the common goal of constructing a strong socialist country. So, in North Korean society, uh, various ways, I think, uh, have been uh, implemented to improve the elementary and secondary education. So, can you uh, explain in which context the emphasis of science and technology uh, is coming out? Uh, second, I would like to get some more explanation on the influence of the announced educational reform on actual education experiences. So, you did an analysis of uh, the studies with the, and the surveys with the, the students who studied at the elementary and secondary education uh, students. And so can you explain how this uh, education reform uh, influences the students? Is it just a slogan, or does it really impact their education and it, for the teachers, too? What are some realistic difficulties that they face as they try to implement it, this reform. There is a big gap between the city and ruler areas in North Korea. So how are they overcoming the 
realistic situation there in implementing uh, education reform. And thirdly, on the teacher policy, the Kim Jong-un regime is trying to improve the qualitative and quantitative uh, quality of their teachers. So as you mentioned in your presentation, social and economic changes of North Korea change the expectations of North Korean citizens uh, and about occupation. So the respect uh, that teachers received and in the past teachers uh, were expected to provide ID to provide uh, teachings on ideology and to act as role models and ideology. But there have been changes there, it seems. So how are those changes being implemented? And uh, I would also like to know uh, if uh, real high achieving students do want to become teachers. Fourth, uh, there is um, seems to be an interest in global trends and uh, trying to create their reform to meet these global trends. But what is global defined by North Korea? For example, recent international education reforms are based on core future competencies provided by OECD education policy committees. Um, like there are various uh, uh, programs such as PISA and and uh, Tim's trends on international mathematics and science study. And then I would like to know if Global by uh, the Kim Jong-un regime thinks and wants to follow such uh, programs such as P PISA and Tim's uh, try to get high like standards there. And are there certain stand rather countries that North Korea benchmarks as a role model uh, also? Um, North Korea, how do they view themselves? Because if they compare themselves with these international standards and uh, try to follow global trends, then they will see themselves. And uh, so I wanted to ask you uh, how this analysis is impacting uh, North Korea's education and society. Lastly, I would like to hear about the direction of the changes of elementary and secondary education in North Korea. Uh, you predicted in this uh, study. Uh, recently, provincial governments, education offices, and uh, city education offices are trying to present various ways for culture and education exchanges. And uh, uh, there are many researchers who develop common curriculums or education activities can be used that can be used by both South and North Koreans. So will these education exchanges be implemented? Could it be implemented? And what are good ways for us to cooperate with North Korea through education? Most of all, uh, thank you. I would like to thank you for uh, giving us the presentation so we can study about the recent changes of North Korean society through reform and education. Uh, North and South education uh, have gone their separate ways, so I hope that this uh, uh, session can provide us more understanding. Uh, so you have given a lot of questions and uh, homework for our uh, presenter. So we will hear from the three discussants and then give the presenters an opportunity to answer. Next, we will be hearing from Ku Seok. Kang, and he is going to be presenting, uh, rather providing a discussion for higher education. So I am from Cheonnam University. My name is Kusop Kang. I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, precious opportunity. As I listen to the two presentations, I realize uh, I visited my perception of North Korea. Now, although people say that North Korea has changed a lot, uh, but the image that I have of North Korea uh, is still one of where cows uh, graze the pasture. So these are images from you know decades past. So we still have this bias against North Korea. Uh, but uh, today, you talked about the utilization of the tablet PCs in education. These are more modern images. And I think both images uh, probably coexist in North Korea, but we still uh, you know stick oftentimes to the older image of North Korea. So on the one hand, we have we know that there are changes that are taking place in North Korea. At the same time, we need to change our mindset and view of um, North Korea. Uh, now, the presentation. Uh, 
touched upon the reform of higher education sector in view of the era of knowledge based uh, economy and society that North Korea tries to adapt to. Uh, so how we should approach the exchange in the higher education sector between the two Koreas uh, is something that we can um, it is a question uh, that this presentation perhaps can help answer. Uh, and we could see that there are many changes taking place in North Korea. So there was a shift away from the colleges to towards more university focus and then back to the college focus system. Uh, and also there is the academic type colleges and then there are the practical type colleges. So there are very dynamic changes taking place in North Korea. And so what kind of change that took place and what outcomes resulted uh, is something that we need to look into. But uh, because of the limitation in access to information, oftentimes we don't get the full picture. So I hope uh, that um, the, doc the presenter could uh, elaborate a little bit on the outcomes. Uh, and I heard uh, that a North Korean scholar submitted an academic paper in one of the Korean academic journals. And I heard also that sciences, uh, scientists in North Korea uh, have submitted a lot of um, you know, research papers in academic journals uh, at the international arena. So this seems that North Korea is trying to engage internationally because they feel the need to advance themselves. And North Koreans are fully aware of the need to have this international exchange. Uh, and, and I think by looking into these research papers, perhaps we could glean uh, what academic efforts are taking place in the higher education sector in North Korea. Uh, and as was noted in the presentation, international exchange has been emphasized by the North Korean government. In fact, uh, 12 students of Kim Il-sung University visited the uh, Berlin Free University in Germany. Also, there are cases where North Korean students who have engaged in MBA programs uh, abroad and other programs abroad. So there are these um, you know, uh, exchanges taking place internationally. So perhaps we can link with the research institutes or higher education institutes uh, outside of the Korean Peninsula uh, that have engaged with North Korean students and scholars. Uh, and if we can link with these institutions, perhaps we can indirectly uh, gather access to what changes are taking place in North Korea and what the experience was with the North Korean students. And uh, because there are limitation of information, it's very difficult to engage in exchange with North Korea. Uh, but there are a lot of North Korean uh, schools and institutions that are working with uh, international organizations and entities. So perhaps we could have our uh, organizations work with those international organizations so that from them we can learn uh, about potential opportunities for cooperation with North Korean uh, high school, uh, higher education sector. Uh, so I have generally covered my comments rather than the questions, but I think that given the limitation in the access of information, it's very uh, difficult to uh, you know, paint a full picture. Uh, and I heard um, Dr. Jung had difficult in accessing uh, data with regards to North Korean educational sector. And North Korea oftentimes uploads information on website. And if you Google, uh, you can also find web pages of North Korean colleges and universities. But the websites, if you click on those websites, and this is my personal experience, if I link, uh, you know, click on the link, the pop-up uh, says that, um, you know, due to national security law here in Korea, you cannot further access 
access this website. So we are blocked from accessing the North Korean educational institutions' websites. Uh, so in the past, in the Cold War era, I mean, that was probably understandable. But, um, you know, given the uh, thawing of relations uh, that we're trying to achieve with North Korea, is it really necessary to uh, continue strictly restricting access to uh, such websites in North Korea? Uh, maybe uh, uh, for the general public, maybe it, it, it's um, OK. But uh, for the scholars, at least selectively for research purposes, I think there should be more um, access given so that we can have a fuller uh, research uh, outcomes. So just at least on a selective basis, if we can have better access to information about North Korea, uh, that would be very helpful. So maybe we really need to diversify uh, our source of information about North Korea. I mean, we have to know North Korea in order to, uh, you know, whether it be higher education or other educational sectors, we can cooperate. So we need to have more proactive uh, approach when it comes to information access. Thank you very much. Uh, so in doing research on North Korea and also in promoting cooperation uh, between the two countries. I think your feedback was very important. Now we will hear from Dr. Ho Jae Kang from Berlin Free University. Uh, is the screen visible? Uh, recent changes in North Korea include the uh, education in science and technology. And in one media coverage, uh, it was mentioned that there is not enough uh, discussion on science and technology in North Korea uh, with regards to this forum. Well, uh, although this was in the context of educational sector, uh, the two presenters did touch upon science and technological development in North Korea. And among the changes in education, uh, we need to highlight uh, the changes in the types of schools. Uh, uh, you know, this was sort of mentioned in the overall educational system, uh, but I think we need to elaborate on this further. So uh, there is what's called the techno technological um, upper secondary school. This has been newly created. So as North Korea expanded the compulsory education to 12 years, it was decided that this type of technological upper secondary school would be introduced. And uh, in 2014, uh, it was decided that on a pilot scale that the school would be established. So the general upper secondary school will fo focus more on the general subjects and knowledge, but the technological upper secondary schools would focus a lot on uh, delivering basic technological uh, education and training so that the students could be um, uh, human resources that can really exercise their skills. And so in 2016, uh, it was decided that we need to have these people ha uh, have at least one or more modern technologies. And uh, the areas include metal, uh, coal, electricity. So each region has a specific industry focus. And in view of those industry focus, these technological upper secondary schools would be spe specializing their education. And in 2018, they newly added the information technology um, programs. So about um, 11 schools uh, adopted this on a pilot scale. And then this year, uh, it is important, it was de deemed that it is important to have these information technology uh, programs. So there are city, 190 cities and counties in North Korea. And so they added this information technology education in these 190 uh, technological upper secondary schools. 
So this is actually nationwide. So whereas in 2017, there were different areas, eight areas of specialization, but the information technology uh, that has actually been expanded across the country into some 300 schools. And so they also plan to introduce apparel uh, related, apparel manufacturing related technologies and also locomotives technologies program uh, going forward. Now, Computers and information technologies related work uh, were assigned to the more uh, intelligent and smarter uh, students uh, to research and to develop. So these efforts were taken up by Joseon Computer Center and Pyongyang Computer Center, which is uh, a more elite uh, institutions. And also there it was the uh, National Institute of Science, Natural Science, and uh, Kim Il Sung University and Kim Cheok. Kim Chek University of uh, Technology uh, would focus on this. And then at, a, at the secondary level, there is the number one uh, upper secondary school that would be focused on the information technology. And then in 2008, they have the uh, Electronic uh, Work Research Institute that is founded. Uh, so this was established in 2008, and this is when Kim Jong-un uh, was taking over. And uh, that's when Kim Jong-un uh, visited with Kim Jong-il uh, uh, the Chagangdo uh, Research Center. So the city and provin province and county level uh, electronic work research centers are set up uh, so that programs are developed to facilitate work. And uh, although the statistics are unclear, at least about 200 of these centers are established across Korea. And so from nationwide uh, centers, they have been able to increase the numbers of these centers to cover the smaller uh, local areas. And so North Korea basically sets and makes an example by setting a successful center and then tries to disseminate that model uh, across uh, North Korea. And uh, I think this is an effort to achieve innovation and to disseminate the fruits of that innovation to a wider um, area. And in 2018, the uh, IT uh, program of the technological upper secondary school was newly introduced. So I think uh, perhaps this is replacing this electronic work research centers that were first uh, introduced in 2008. And then I believe uh, there is this new discourse of the new century that has been emphasized. Uh, so basically, the new century discourse was proposed in 2009, calling for a greater capacity building of the government office, officials and officers. And then in 2010, uh, there was this um, new century discourse on environmental projects. And then in 2011, there was the new century industrial revolution discourse emerged. And then in uh, the next and the following year, the new century university and school discourse was announced, and then the new century uh, mechanics and new century river management and new century power. Uh, powerful state construction, and then the new century economic structure and agricultural development discourses were announced in each year. Uh, but for 2011 and 2012, there were very specific uh, uh, call for the new century revolution for the industries and for education. Basically, uh, it's not trying to make North Korea uh, 
industry and education be on par with uh, our other class, world class, but they want to establish their own distinct North Korean model of education industry. Thank you very much. Uh, in Dr. Kim's uh, presentation, also there was talk uh, of the technological upper secondary uh, schools and also uh, Dr. Kang just uh, talked about the new century uh, education discourse. Thank you very much for touching upon that. Now I would like to ask the presenters to uh, respond to the comments and questions by the discussants. So I think you have a lot to respond to. Uh, Professor Kim? Can you put my presentation material on the screen? While reading uh, Ji He Kim's uh, discussion paper, I was impressed uh, by how well written it was. Before we talk about uh, the making all people well versed in science and technology, I want to uh, comment on what uh, Dr. Kang said with compulsory education system being changed. Uh, the science uh, technology school has been added and the school system is very similar to that of Korea but for North Korea it's a major change because since 1953 uh, they maintain a linear system single line system so the Soviet Union and in the socialist countries, they did not have like a, a two-track system. It was a singular system. But since 2012 and 2014, especially in the advanced science and technology school, it is a dual track system, which is uh, diverging from the socialist system, ed socialist education system. This, that's very meaningful. And uh, that is uh, linked with what Dr. Kang said. I don't agree 100%, but I agree uh, to a large extent because they had elite education, and then did they decided to provide information education nationwide. And the city and to the local levels, uh, they are now attempting to have information and technology education. And that, I think, is related to the first question provided by Dr. Kim, on making all people well-versed in science and technology, how is this different from the previous slogan of making whole society intelligent? I think that this slogan is used to move away from the previous ideology type of education to more professional education. And I think, frankly, this is because of their survival. North Korea they said that they were a paradise on this world and that uh, it was a great country, but during the arduous march, their propaganda, they realize it cannot be accepted. And uh, Kim Jong-un has experience studying in Europe. And uh, he knows that uh, in slogan and propaganda that their country is a paradise, but uh, he knows that this is not reality. And he also understands that uh, North Korea is lagging behind other countries and for survival they have to change it came out of a desperate situation and the slogan is making all people well versed in science and technology which are trying to catch up to the global standards. Uh, they are stressing global standards because they know that they need catching up to do. According to a research that uh, came out recently in the economic magazines of uh, North Korea, when you do a keyword analysis, the major keyword according to Nor the um, Korea Bank, they says it's opening up. It's been eight years since Kim Jong-un's regime started. And in major economic journals, the key word for them is opening up. And this means that North Korea, for their survival, are making preparations for opening up. They are trying to develop science and technology, and this has to be backed by education. Uh, Dr. Cho uh, said this too, uh, leaping forward through science, and uh, they should uh, improve uh, through uh, education. And so I think this shows that uh, they are in a disparate situation. And on the second question, 
What's the actual student experience? So they talk about uh, education reform, but uh, what's the perception of actual students? Uh, last year, I did an interview on to 10 students who attended uh, elementary and secondary schools in North Korea, and I felt that uh, there is a big gap between to urban areas and rural areas. Uh, urban area students uh, talked about uh, computer usage experience and multimedia classrooms, uh, but those who received education in rural areas, they said that there is a computer room, but half of the computers are out of uh, not working, and uh, it was not easy to receive distant uh, education. So North Korea is in the process of uh, improving their education system, and uh, it will will probably change every year. So the students that I met was in 2015. It showed that there was a gap in urban and rural areas, and even the North Korean government recognizes this. Uh, the gap seems to be narrowing, though, uh, and uh, the funding for the infrastructure improvement, you might be surprised, but uh, the government uh, uses a lot of budget for improving their university infrastructure. But since the liberation of Korea, the elementary schools, it was based on the donation and funding of the citizens living there. That's a tradition of North Korea. So the factories and the companies in that region, they donate computers. In a socialist society, this might be natural because that uh, company's assets are the assets of the country, so they can uh, use uh, that uh, those assets. But these days, market economy has entered North Korea, so it's not easy to do that. But to two months for a, in the schools, the farms and uh, the um, businesses, they provide labor and assets to improve the schools, donating computers in the elementary schools. And uh, through such funding and efforts, uh, they are improving the infrastructure of elementary and secondary schools, and the government budget is not allocated a lot. And the effectiveness of uh, teacher uh, education, I interviewed five teachers as well. With the Kim Jong-un regime, it seems that the um, treatment for teachers has improved. I know about more than 100 teachers, and uh, the teachers uh, that have defected North Korea after the Kim Jong-un regime, I don't see many defectors. So I think uh, that uh, uh, teachers in the previous regimes uh, face difficulties. And uh, the um, managers in factories and uh, officials in um, like factories and uh, in the administration, uh, they uh, have good livelihoods. Uh, but uh, teachers were not like that. So there were many teacher defectors. But uh, since the Kim Jong Un regime, we don't see a lot of Kim Jong Un regime. Kim Jong-un regime teacher defectors. So it seems that the change in the treatment for teachers is having a certain effect, it seems to be. And when I ask the teachers, they talk about getting in-service training and such science and technology um, like retraining is taking place for teachers. Uh, global trend. So what is the standard for global trend? North Korea, when they talk about the global trend, is it the OECD standard? They don't talk about uh, the specifics. They don't uh, talk about uh, what it actually is. But uh, the university professors, it's controlled uh, what uh, sites they are visiting, but they can access the internet. And uh, they use uh, the information and material to uh, gather for their database. And uh, these university professors, they are asked to uh, like make publications in major journals and participate in uh, societies. So they don't say specifically what the global standard is, but uh, they are trying to create a standard of their own that meets global standards using uh, resources on the internet. And uh, this is my personal experience. It seems that they are trying to reference the Finland 
uh, system. Uh, the Finland Education Office, uh, they uh, suggested to South Korean uh, Education Office uh, that North Korea wants to work with them and South Korea, are you willing to work with us for the North Korean project? Uh, and South Korea wanted to, but it seemed that North Korea uh, did not want to participate with South Korea, and it was re-educating teachers and changing the curriculum. And it seemed that North Korea was interested in the Finland system in changing their uh, curriculum uh, because Finland recently uh, changed their elementary and secondary education to be modular, to be more flexible. And uh, I heard that North Korea is preparing for this uh, new curriculum and it seems that they are considering the Finland system. So this might be related to the uh, global standard that uh, North Korea is considering. And uh, lastly, on the inter-Korean cooperation and exchange, what might be possible. At the moment, North Korea is avoiding uh, cooperation and exchange with uh, South Korea. They are avoiding this. They are uh, directing their eyes toward Europe. It seems that they have received orders or direction that they should not cooperate in exchange with South Korea. Yet we need to, to uh, still continue to work on this, uh, especially in areas of uh, curriculum reform and uh, teacher retraining and uh, information and technology enhancement. We talk about Green New Deal and uh, information and uh, education uh, and in information technology being combined. These are areas that we are considering to, too. So these are major areas that we can consider. Thank you. So when I give you the opportunity to uh, provide your comments, we can get a lot of information, it seems. So next, we will be hearing from Dr. Uh, Cho. Uh, on top of uh, the discussant Kang's questions, if anything that you would like to add, you may. Well, Dr. Kusop Kang did not specifically ask questions, but I think uh, he delivered comments that are complementary to my presentation. So I do agree in general to what Dr. Kang has commented, and I would like to add my comments, and also I would like to uh, talk about, uh, uh, respond to some of the questions. Uh, Dr. Kang did not raise any questions about my presentation, but I'm very grateful because he said some things that I have wanted to say. And uh, he talked about the you know, inaccessibility of information about North Korea. And, and that's something that I feel too. For example, Kim Il-sung University has own, its own website. And uh, they, I believe, has have uh, recently updated a lot of information about the, you know, departments and curriculum that they have. And uh, Kim Il-sung University is uh, trying to invite international students to uh, come to, uh, you know, North Korea and study. Uh, so they have a lot of information information available on the website. But when we try to access the website, we're not given access. And so I asked, uh, uh, you know, uh, one agency uh, that would perhaps give us clearance to access it, and they said no, uh, because you know they believe that um, the Korean government's uh, official position is to cut off access. Uh, so you know, uh, one alternative is to kind of go around that restriction and to seek a cooperation from someone in another country. So the Korean scholar. Uh, because the Korean scholar cannot access the North Korean university website, this scholar would have to ask a friend in another country uh, to uh, access that website on his or her own behalf and um, search for information. Dr. Kang studies in Germany, so he can freely access newspaper articles, website information coming out of DPRK. So he has gathered a lot of information and data and has sent it over to me to help my research. So that's the situation that uh, Korean scholars face here in South Korea. Uh, and uh, Dr. Kang talked about uh, technical upper secondary school, and he also talked about the uh, uh, electronic 
work research centers that I really do not know about. But uh, if I look back on the technological upper secondary school, uh, in 2010, uh, they created the information department in most of the colleges, even if it's an agricultural university. So they added these information technology departments in these different universities. So let's say it's a forestry department in a university. And if you graduate from a forestry information department, the graduate from that department will be dealing with uh, you know, digital and information aspects of forestry. Uh, so because the you know people who studied in you know digital technologies and engineering you know they would not often go to forestry or agriculture uh, so now what they're trying to do is to have students study in the technological upper secondary school so that they become well versed in information technology so that they can actually work on computer systems in their respective industry. So in order to train these uh, workers who can actually use information technology in the industrial fields, they have probably uh, created these technological upper secondary schools. And the gap between the schools, urban and rural, is quite uh, significant. And I have interviewed some 20 to 30 students who have come from DPRK, especially uh, the access to digital technologies. There's a significant gap. So at the university level, for example, the Kim Chek University of Technology, uh, I recently met a person who had studied uh, at the university for about two years ago. And he said that if you don't have a laptop, you can't really study at the Kim Chek University of Technology because everyone has one. And, uh, you know, you would connect it to a port and uh, the professor does not write on the blackboard. He has a USB a thumb drive and uh, he would disseminate the, you know, the files from that USB thumb drive and that would be uploaded onto the screen in the classroom and the students would be looking at that screen. So I was really surprised. That's the level of access to technology at the Kim Chek University of Technology. But in the same time frame, uh, a, a student who had studied at a teacher's university uh, said that maybe one course in the year uh, is about computer technology. And there are some students who have computers that they bring, but the rest don't. And uh, the content of that class is not very advanced. They learn to utilize the word program. And the you know, graduate thesis paper must be uh, typed and submitted in a word format. So if the student does not have, uh, you know, skills to utilize these computer programs, sometimes the professor actually types it up for that student so that that person can graduate. Uh, so the access to computers and ownership of computers is very limited in, in such schools. And uh, the gap is significantly wide at the upper secondary schools as well across the regions. The Rason City uh, was a place uh, where uh, the this, this student I met uh, had lived in. Uh, Rasan city is actually a very well-off city, uh, almost similar in economic levels to Pyongyang. And in a school there, they have network connection uh, to in the schools. And uh, sometimes they actually have computer-based testing. Some students would use the computers in the classroom. Uh, some of the other students actually bring their uh, his or her own laptop uh, and use that but if the you know students who bring their own computers might actually cheat on the text so they have CCTV in the classroom to monitor to see whether uh, any of the students are cheating so that's a case of any uh, a school that is very uh, well furnished with computer systems but most of the other schools at the upper secondary level did not have such extensive access to computers and also uh, there is a great emphasis on um, digital technology education and there are extracurricular uh, team activities and the students who are interested 
in digital technologies can get involved in such extracurricular activities focusing on computer skills and they can actually learn how to manipulate and uh, edit images and uh, that can help their employability after graduation from the school and personally they like to you know uh, you know doctor the photo files uh, which sometimes uh, they can use to make extra money on the side. So uh, there is a general uh, discrepancy in the level of computer access uh, in the uh, schools. Now, UNESCO's International uh, Standard of class uh, Classification of Education, that standard is a standardized classification of education systems that has been defined by UNESCO. And one journal I saw uh, featured how North Korea was um, actually presenting this UNESCO's standardized educational um, classification. So that's one. Uh, you know, international standard that DPRK was showcasing and sharing within the country. But in most cases, in DPRK documents, they say, uh, uh, you know, they're using this curriculum in this certain country. And, you know, this other country is using this type of curriculum. So usually these countries that they cite are northern European countries or Japan and China, but they don't specifically say what country. So they do reference these uh, pra educational practices in other countries, but they don't specifically say what country. And they don't just um, bring those international cases and just plant it within their local educational environment. They try to modify it to meet their needs. Now, right now, uh, if we bring this discussion to opportunities for inter-Korean cooperation, well, in, even if the local you know, governments in Korea want to engage with North Korea, right now it's practically impossible. But North Korea is, is interested in working with UNESCO and UNICEF, and there are still ongoing um, exchanges between North Korea uh, and these international organizations. So South Korea can involved in those initiatives. And uh, vocational technology education is an area of focus for North Korea. Uh, in Korea, we have uh, at the secondary level uh, vocational education and training. And uh, Korea is rather advanced in that area. So perhaps that can be a, a topic where we can sort of engage with North Korea on because they're interested. The Thank you very much. Uh, we are scheduled to end at 5.30, and uh, I can see that it is now 5.29. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We uh, can have a Q&A session. However, we have not received uh, questions thus far from our online audience. So since uh, every time we give the speakers and discussants an opportunity to speak, uh, they give us uh, so much information and insight, um, I would like to ask if any of the speakers or discussants would like to provide some comments on North Korea's education reform or uh, what uh, insights and implications we can draw from such reform for inter-Korean education uh, exchange. So uh, in reference to Dr. 
Kim's presentation. Can I get the slide which uh, shows a picture of the textbook? So I would like to talk a little bit about the textbook change in North Korea uh, based on my experience. I think it was 2011 and uh, 2013 uh, contents of the textbook in North Korea. Until 2011, there were some revisions and then in and uh, there was talk of educational revolution and everything changed. And I majored in science and um, mathematics, and I saw something interesting. So Dr. Kim talked about the experimentation. Uh, and I looked at the physics textbooks from 2011 and 2013 and saw uh, how they compared. And so the contents uh, feature the key uh, physics concepts. So the chapters uh, were about the individual concepts. So there were nouns that were titles of the uh, uh, of the in the, uh, in the chapter titles, but in 2013 there are questions that form each chapters, uh, and so. In the, pa uh, in the new textbooks, they first pose a question, uh, you know, asking the students to examine and make observations of the things around you. And they pose questions to have the students discuss with these classmates. And also, there was an essay writing assignment with regards to physics topics. For example, in the past, the questions were about calculating how fast a person would arrive after running uh, at what speed. But, you know, in the new textbooks, the questions were rather different. And and uh, but of course, it's not just questions. Uh, you know, the knowledge uh, also needs to be delivered. And towards the end of the chapters, they have all the knowledge and research uh, results that have formed uh, the body of physics knowledge. And, and so uh, the contents, the knowledge content itself, uh, is quite similar to the earlier uh, textbooks. But the difference is that they begin with questions, and then. And one in one of the uh, chapters, this student uh, really thinks about where to place the mirror. And uh, this student, in the example in the textbook, thinks about the strengths, weaknesses of the different positioning of the mirror in the room. And this shows the logical and rational, uh, you know, logical decision-making process based on scientific reasoning. And so the number of problems actually decreased by 20 to 30 percent, but the actual solution, uh, you know, delivered for each of the problems is more extensive and it provides more conceptual understanding of the principles. So it provides opportunity for students to really engage in discussions. And I think there was greater emphasis on the metaphysical aspects uh, of uh, the content. So thank you very much for adding that comment. Uh, you added information about technological upper secondary schools, and uh, you also talked about the change in the way textbooks are composed and the uh, educational content is delivered. Thank you very much for that. Any other presenter or um, discussant? I wanted to add another page, and just by looking at this page, uh, up until 2011, textbooks were in white and black, uh, black and white, and it was uh, text centered. It did not have uh, colorful pictures. In 2013, they have a lot of uh, pictures, and it's in color. Uh, that's because looking at the pictures, uh, they uh, ask questions, and uh, they want uh, the students to engage in research activities. So it's just two years, but. Uh, 
This is for uh, first year of upper secondary education, and it's a chemistry textbook. And uh, the fact that the textbook format dramatically changed from black and white to color, and uh, the uh, format that has shifted from knowledge centered to research activity centered shows how dramatically the reform was uh, carried out. And I felt that the teachers are like, trying to catch up because although the the textbook changes, the activities in the classrooms uh, don't change overnight. They need to be re-educated. The conditions have to be met to change their teaching methodology, but at least in terms of the uh, textbook, it changed greatly, and you can refer to the explanation provided by Dr. Kang. So I did not actually ask a lot of questions, but uh, based on what Dr. Kim and Master, uh, Dr. Cho mentioned, I would like to comment. Uh, before, there was mention that the North Korean authorities have an interest in uh, learning about the Finnish educational model, and there were, um, you know, efforts to cooperate with Finland. Actually, uh, there was, um, you know, the case where North Korea. Oh, actually, uh, East Germany uh, benchmarked the Finnish educational model significantly before uh, reunification. And so in the socialist bloc, uh, the Finnish educational model seems uh, to be a great example. But after reunification of Germany, the East German education was completely replaced by West German education. but. Right now, the German uh, educational results based on the international uh, assessments have gone down significantly. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, is that the Eastern German education, perhaps the content itself was a bit behind, but uh, the system itself was quite had many advantages. Uh, and so the West. Uh, and Germany it, it has um, sort of uh, rethought about potentially uh, taking uh, uh, some advantages that should have been preserved uh, from the East German model. But anyway, uh, I would like to ask a question to Dr. Cho. As you mentioned, uh, you know, North Korea has a comprehensive educational reform plan for the higher education sector. Uh, the structure and the content uh, reform is taking place. But you mentioned there is significant gap between the rural and the urban areas, and also there is significant gap between you know the centrally supported universities and the more provincial universities. Uh, so. So the reforms uh, probably are taking place at a more localized uh, aspect uh, rather than taking place overall nationwide. So how should we uh, understand and evaluate this educational reform in North Korea? Uh, so instead of just broadly saying that North Korea is trying to uh, achieve this kind of educational reform uh, for so and so purposes, but um, I think we should be more pointed uh, in our discussions about what needs to happen in North Korean education and what's happening in North Korea and what we should plan uh, sort of to maybe uh, support them uh, in the future when we have the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Cho, could you respond? Actually, the question is a, a quite a difficult one to answer. And uh, North Korea does have a long-term uh, educational reform strategy, but we do not have information. If we could get our hands on that reform document, you know, we would have a clearer picture. But as I mentioned, we had to go roundabout way to sort of glean what's happening. So we don't have a clear picture. But my feeling is that there is a wide educational gap. And for North Korea, this is a big challenge. And uh, Kim Jong-un is aware of this. But there are no physical resources available to really narrow that gap. So then they have to make a choice. 
there are top class universities who are considered the academic type universities, which is more focused on elite education. So for the go will the government just focus on these elite universities? Or will the government maybe reduce the support for these elite universities and try to uh, you know, distribute the funds to a, a larger number of universities so that overall the quality of education will rise? But I think it's the former approach that North Korea is taking place. Although North Korea does want to improve the overall educational quality, uh, there are limited resources. So what about the other universities? Of course, uh, the, Nash the North Korean discourse uh, announced talks about what must be done, where, but the actual government support is not there to make that possible. And as Dr. Kim mentioned, at the individual school level, they make do with what they have. The central government sets standards and uh, hands down instructions, but they are not able to provide the financial means to make that possible. So all they can do is provide political messages and goals down to the schools, but the schools themselves will have to come up with the means to somehow uh, make this possible. So the universities, and colleges at the more local level, uh, you know, given the limitation of resources, they would actually seek the help of the students and the parents themselves. I also have a comment. In addition to up, uh, higher education, Elementary and secondary education is similar. If you compare Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-in, it's a stark difference. They have an exemplary school and you make the other schools follow. That was the same for Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and Kim Jong-in. But in the Kim Jong-il, their uh, exemplary schools were sent to, to rural areas, and they made the ruler schools uh, the best school, making a ruler school a best school, and if the other schools follow, it uh, is realistic if possible, and it's a socialist era, so uh, it, there was um, less of a gap, and the factories and the farms uh, supported the the material that was needed at the school. That's why nationwide uh, the schools did not have a big gap during the Kim Il-sung era, but uh, these days they still have exemplary schools, but it's in cities. They have uh, the exemplary schools in major cities, and that school has outstanding facility, but uh, the rural area schools cannot uh, uh, follow the exemplary school. They are making these exemplary schools every year. In 2011, uh, Kim Jong-un uh, launched his regime, and uh, they started opening these exemplary schools, and they still are opening exemplary schools. I'm sure there is a difference in what uh, types of schools they are, but still there is a big gap, and uh, now the market economy is taking up a big portion, so they cannot uh, provide the budget, to, uh, unless they provide the budget to improve these schools, uh, it can't uh, they cannot reduce the gap. Uh, and so realistically, at this point, it will be difficult to narrow the gap just uh, through the funding from the local communities. So um, since there is more time, I would like to ask a question about that. In North Korea, education uh, and livelihood. Uh, so when it comes to uh, livelihood, uh, the on the Kim Jong Un uh, administration, uh, the you know we can see that there were certain improvements in the uh, livelihood. That's one of the um, mandates of the you know the central government. Education is another uh, aspect that the central government needs to be responsible for. But since, based on what you're saying, it appears that um, they're not really, uh, you know, taking up that responsibility. So what is the central party doing to address this educational gap? Well, uh, again, they send out political messages and visions. Uh, so what are they doing in terms of um, political 
uh, vision setting. In North Korea, they assess schools. And which province uh, and which schools in uh, which province did best? And they assess, uh, you know, different categories uh, of themes. For example, teachers. Uh, so, for example, in this category, uh, you know, schools in this province is number one. This uh, schools in uh, this other province is number two. So they're doing a lot of these assessments of schools in different uh, provinces. So that is to kind of uh, stimulate the schools and uh, to have them work harder. But it's not like they are given any incentives, uh, you know, for the schools that are doing well. They're just constantly assessing so that it sort of uh, serves as a whip and uh, that it, they're sort of, um, uh, you know, trying to get the schools to work harder to improve their quality. In the case of universities, they're doing an integration of the universities. So what this means is that for lower ranking universities in the provinces, uh, the professors uh, do not have enough means to develop curriculum. And, uh, you know, for example, the professors in North Korea actually do have to create their own curricular material themselves. So now what they're doing is the central party uh, will support this one university to develop the curricular materials and that will then be disseminate, disseminated to the other uh, you know, universities in the rural area so that they can benchmark those uh, materials. Uh, and using those materials, they retrain the professors and the teachers. So these are some of the things that central party can take on to improve educational quality in North Korea. So when you um, it is true that uh, the Workers' Party is taking uh, responsibility, but uh, the Central Workers' Party cannot take on all of the responsibility. Even if the Central Workers' Party gives orders, uh, the Provincial and Regional Workers' Party have to take on responsibilities to improve the, the school situation. And uh, we see that uh, the school uh, improvements are not done uniformly. They keep on uh, talking about uh, how the school facilities are continuously improving, which shows that there are continuous problems, so it's not completed. As you know, when there is a goal, it should be done nationwide for all schools, but it, it doesn't work that way. So once they have certain facilities, they go on to the next one and the next one. In 1998 and 1999, we created multimedia classrooms, uh, throughout the nation, unless the central government supports this, the local government in making improvements, and especially since the budget doesn't come from the central government, it's provided via the donation of the local communities and work through the people living there, there will be a gap and it cannot be equal because of that situation. There, So there has to be continuous improvement. I, uh, perhaps because of my ignorance, but um, I don't have, I only have sporadic uh, pieces of information about North Korea, uh, maybe through the media coverage or from hearsay. But um, today, your presentations and the three uh, discussions provided by the discussants helped me uh, get a more uh, greater understanding of the North Korean situation and uh, have a better picture of uh, the situation in North Korea. But, uh, you know, I think we each uh, started to come up with different questions, and I think it is not enough to have this kind of a forum uh, to end one time. We need to have continuous discussion and more research. And one of the discussants mentioned that access to information in conducting uh, research on North Korea is a key uh, challenge facing our scholars here. So with that, I would like to close uh, this session. As I uh, mentioned, 
uh, this is part of uh, the Korea Educational Development Institute's um, uh, Korea Educational Development Institute organized this session, uh, and we heard from two distinguished presenters and also the three distinguished um, discussants. And this is also streamed online, real time. So there are many participants who are on scene. Uh, but uh, once again, thank you, everyone, for your participation. This concludes our session.